And as promised, uh, I'm going to get into anti-slavery, uh, the movement to abolish slavery, uh, otherwise known as abolitionism. <clears throat> Excuse me. So uh, let's uh, let's start with this. Uh, abolitionist organizations arose starting in the 18th century, specifically in the more like late 18th century, first in Europe and actually specifically in England, uh, which I'll get into. Uh, and then abolition uh, abolitionism, uh, these abolitionist ideas made their way pretty quickly to America, which I'll, I'll talk about as well. Okay, so although slavery was common in the British Empire uh, in the 18th century and, and even before that, <clears throat> um, it, existed, it existed mostly in colonial plantations uh, away from the British Isles, away from uh, uh, England and, and the continent of Europe. Uh, by the 1770s, actually only 15,000 Africans were enslaved in England itself, uh, most of them uh, enslaved as essentially domestic servants. Uh, most English citizens rarely have ever saw the full effects of slavery, and as a result, few uh, actually gave it much thought. Um, <clears throat> now, this changed in 1772 when the Bostonian Charles Stewart uh, recaptured his slave, uh, whose name was James Somerset, James Somerset, who'd escaped while accompanying his master on a trip to England. So Stewart made preparations to send Somerset uh, to the West Indies for resale. Uh, Somerset, however, had made friends um, and uh, had actually been baptized during his stay. And his godparents actually interceded on his behalf, issuing a writ of habeas corpus uh, and forcing, uh, forcing the issue to go to trial. Uh, Lord Man Mansfield, Chief Justice of the King's Bench, um, uh, decided the case, issued a judgment that ended, quote, this is from uh, Lord Mansfield, uh, the Chief Justice, quote, whatever in inconveniences, therefore, uh, may follow from decision, um, I cannot uh, I cannot say this case is allowed or approved by the law of England, uh, and therefore the black must be discharged, end quote. So the black must be discharged. Um, so that was a big change that was uh, important, right? So Lord Mansfield's deci uh, decision uh, called into question whether and how slavery could be enforced in Great Britain. And uh, a large segment of the population wrongly concluded uh, that slavery was abolished, um, uh, but that was actually not the case. Uh, regardless of legal, legal uh, decisions made in London, slavery continued to flourish in the West Indies. So slavery is sort of on its way out in the British Isles and places like, um, like London, right? Uh, the West Indies is a different, uh, the West Indies is the British Caribbean, in this case, the British Caribbean essentially, um, <clears throat> and their slave-based plantation economies in places like Barbados and, and Jamaica. So uh, that continued. Um, but uh, the abolitionist seed had been sowed, <laughs> so to speak, right? Uh, the, uh, uh, the movement had started. Um, so more about that. So the first abolitionist organization was actually set up by Quakers in 1783. Uh, if you don't know, Quakers are a Protestant, um, so it's a religious sect. Uh, and it's, uh, it's a denomination. It's a subset of basically Protestant Christianity. Um, and yeah, so the Quakers um, uh, actually started the first abolitionist organization. This is back in 1783 in England. Um, actually, to a certain extent, it was a transatlantic organization um, uh, as well, which I'll get more into. Uh, this was followed in 1787 by the Committee for the Abolition of the Slave Trade, whose membership included Thomas Clark and Granville Sharp. And pictured on the other side of your screen is uh, Thomas Clark, uh, sorry, Thomas Clarkson. Thomas Clarkson, uh, yeah, so he's considered sort of the, the father of the abolitionist movement, along with people like Granville Sharp. Um, actually, I'll leave his picture up for a second here, uh, and, and others. Okay, so again, that's Granville, uh, uh, sorry, that's um, Thomas Clark, <laughs> Clarkson. Um, so Clarkson and Sharp tirelessly uh, investigated the slave trade, writing pamphlets and delivering speeches intended to educate the British public about the horrors of slavery. Uh, they also heavily, promote, heavily promoted the autobiography of former slave Aloda Equiano, um, who joined them on the lecture tours. And by the way, I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think one of the primary sources I assigned you to read was from Ed Equiano's um, autobiography. So his, uh, his narrative, which uh, was, yeah, it was intended as explicitly, uh, it wasn't meant to be objective, right? It was intended as explicitly an anti-slavery um, narrative, right? Um, and that really shines through in, in the excerpt that you guys uh, you guys read, if I'm not mistaken. I think that was week one. Um, 
So anyway, uh, the movement uh, the movement needed a political face, however, and they found it in William Wilberforce, a prominent evangelical member of parliament. So Wilberforce, uh, with the support of powerful political friends such as William Pitt the Younger and Charles Fox, became the most recognized voice in the abolitionist movement uh, in England um, uh, and even around the world to a certain extent uh, for decades. Uh, the anti-slavery group, however, continued to face powerful opposition from planters in the British West Indies, not surprisingly. Uh, they didn't want to give up their slaves, at least without a, without a fight. Uh, their cause was dealt a blow when Britain went to war with France in 1793, creating an atmosphere in which any protests against the status quo were interpreted as basically unpatriotic. Um, so that made for tough political slutting for the abolitionists in, in England, the early abolitionists. Uh, however, the abolitionists did not give up. They didn't relent. And in 1807, uh, in 1807, the slave trade was banned actually in Great Britain, and uh, that was followed in 1833. 1833, um, in a move that uh, a change that benefited from a national move for reform in general, uh, uh, a movement a movement more broadly known as humanitarianism um, to reform a lot of things that a lot of people long had long believed needed reform. Uh, and, uh, and anyway, so in 1833, yeah, benefiting from this national mood of, of reform uh, in England, um, the, uh, these abolitionists actually achieved an even greater goal. Uh, they abolished slavery itself um, in Great Britain and in, uh, most importantly, in the British West Indies. So slavery is officially abolished in Britain in 1833. <clears throat> but of course, at that time, it still very much exists in the United States. So let's get to uh, the British colonies and, and the US. So the United States founding fathers, while writing about freedom and liberty, as, as we've talked about previously, and as McClay has, has talked about, um, were ambivalent uh, enough about the subject of slavery to avoid discussing it directly as much as possible. Uh, for example, the words slave or slavery, uh, as, as has been mentioned before, uh, were never actually mentioned in the Constitution. So the Constitution really punted for the most part on the question of slavery. Uh, and there were severe consequences to that. So the American Revolution, a revolution for, uh, revolution for liberty, inspired an all too brief moment of manumission among some slaveholders, that's important to recognize, uh, especially in the North, but also in the South in some cases. And some slaves actually took the opportunity of the British offer of manumation, uh, manumission uh, to leave the country. By the early 19th century, even some white Southerners were having doubts uh, about how worthwhile the, their peculiar institution uh, actually was. Uh, and most of its supporters presented it um, as a, a distasteful, um, you know, but at the same time necessary evil. That's important to understand, especially, especially as I continue with this, get to the latter portions of this lecture. So, you know, even slaveholders um, did not, in, in a lot of cases, give a full-throated defense of slavery. Um, defenses of slavery came in many different forms and shapes and sizes, but a lot of slaveholders would say say things like, come up with rationalizations like, well, you know, slavery, it'd be better if we didn't have slavery, but I'm not the uh, I'm not the person who enslaved this, and maybe I mentioned this pre previously, but just quickly, um, they would say maybe, uh, you know, I'm not the person who uh, brought this person to, into slavery, uh, and um, so this person, you know, via the slave trade has been brought to uh, where I live, and so if I don't purchase this person, someone else will. And if I purchase this person, I'm gonna treat them, of course, very nicely. Uh, and they'll uh, enjoy a much better time, you know, in my, in my plantation compared to someone else's. So um, uh, defenses like that were common, full-throated, uh, you know, assertions that slavery was uh, positive and beneficial didn't, uh, you know, at this time in the 1820s and early 1830s and, and prior to that were rare. Right. Um, although they existed, they were rare. Uh, that changes, uh, however. So, um, yeah, then in 1831, the abolition of slavery uh, became a serious topic of conversation suddenly. So in Boston, Massachusetts, the Christian pa uh, pacifist uh, William Lloyd Garrison denounced any and all who excused slavery. Um, people, churches, political parties, etc., and founded The Liberator, which was an abolitionist newspaper. Again, this is in 1831. Now, while the circulation of The Liberator uh, was relatively limited, the paper and uh, the paper and uh, Garrison's speaking engagements brought attention, a lot of attention to the issue of slavery. Uh, also, later, later that year, 
Uh, in Northampton, Virginia, a religiously motivated enslaved man named Nat Turner uh, led Virginia slaves in a bloody revolt. Because Nat Turner's rebellion occurred seven months, uh, so, yeah, referring to Nat Turner's rebellion, and because this occurred um, seven months after the publication of The Liberator, many actually blamed Turner's insurrection on Garrison, um, linking abolitionism to the slave revolt. And speaking of the uh, Nat Turner insurrection or Nat Tur Turner uh, rebellion, um, yeah, so that's a depiction uh, of the horrid, as, as it says here, the horrid massacre in Virginia. Um, and I, I think that's a very good, that sort of epitomizes or it's a very good encapsulation of how whites felt about, especially white slaveholders, but even just whites in general felt about um, the, uh, felt about this event, right? Um, so the bloody massacre of uh, white slave owners and their slave owning uh, family seemingly out of nowhere, right? Um, so this um, sent a, a shiver down the spines of, of really all slaveholders, right? Uh, and a reconsideration of uh, if slavery should continue, if it should continue, uh, if it has to continue, uh, what changes we have to make, um, uh, you know, followed predictably, at least from our perspective, followed this, uh, this from their perspective, catac cataclysmic event, right? Uh, <clears throat> so abolitionism developed a newfound immediacy in the aftermath of Turner's slave revolt, uh, which cost the lives of 60 whites and many more uh, African-Americans in retaliation, of course. Um, even some slave owners, uh, fearful for their family's safety, questioned whether slavery was actually worth the risk. There we go. Some opponents of slavery presented the revolt as proof that men, even slaves, uh, could reach a point where they were willing to die for a chance of freedom. Um, the possibility of ending slavery in the Commonwealth uh, was actually taken out by the Virginia legislature, and I believe McClay talks about this, but I'll touch on this briefly here. Uh, yeah, so the possibility of abolishing slavery was taken out by Virginia, the Virginia legislature, and was seriously debated, right? Um, yeah, debated vigorously by both sides. Uh, in the process of this debate, however, with the rest of the country anxiously looking on, a Southern economist named uh, Thomas Roderick Dew framed an argument in favor of slavery's, slavery's retention that would be the backbone of pro-slavery arguments for decades. Um, this spurred even more vigorous debate and activity by slavery's opponents. Um, so the slavery debate is really heating up, especially in places like Virginia, but even all over the United States to a certain extent uh, in the early 1830s, and that is Thomas Roderick Dew. Thomas Robert Dew. So Dew's approach to slavery was practical, uh, couched, in, uh, couched in the language of logic. Uh, the Southern economy, Dew, um, Dew posited, uh, would fall apart overnight if slavery were suddenly abolished, uh, and it might actually never recover. Dew asserted that slaves, uh, that the slaves might never recover as well. Slavery, in Dew's estimation, uh, according to, to Dew's argument, was a force for positive good. Uh, was a force of positive good, I should say. Um, slavery was a positive good, according to Dew, for both the enslavers and the enslaved. Blacks were too uh, backward, according to people like Dew, to fend for themselves. It would be cruel to force them to do so. Uh, it would also be unchristian. Uh, far from being the blight, even perhaps the necessary evil the generations uh, had considered slavery to be, slavery was now presented by men like Dew as a stabilizing social force for good. Uh, those arguments invigorated some individuals who might before have been embarrassed to promote the institution, even as they benefited from it. Individuals like, uh, for example, Thomas Jefferson, who succinctly summed up the problem of slavery um, years earlier. So, this is a famous Jefferson quote about slavery. Jefferson said, quote, we have the wolf by the ears and we can neither hold him nor safely let him go, end quote. So yeah, that, I, I think that very succinctly sums up the problem of, of slavery, right? So there's a, uh, at least for a, a flickering moment, um, for a fleeting moment, broad realization, including among some enslaved holding states, some whites in slave holding states, in the South, um, and even among some slaveholders, that slavery is just becoming untenable for a myriad of reasons, and um, they, and so there's an opportunity to find a path towards doing away with slavery. But as Jefferson said, we have the wolf by the ears, and we can't. So what do you do if you let him go? What is that? Um, what's going to be the result of that, right, uh, for the Southern economy? 
Um, and what's going to be the result of that in terms of race relations, right? Uh, in in the short term, medium term, and even even long term, right? In a country where even people in the north, I mean, certainly in you know 1831 and even around the time of the Civil War, people in the north weren't exactly um, arguing for abolitionism on the bit to the extent they were even arguing. Uh, the anti-slavery position, the abolition, uh, abolitionist position, they most of them certainly weren't arguing um, uh, arguing for it on the basis of black equality. Um, you know, really, uh, re really, no one was outside of like William Lloyd, uh, Lloyd Garrison, right? Um, so, in a country that's still, from our especially contemporary perspective, deeply racist, right, uh, and not just in the South, um, what's going to happen if these slaves slaves are um, suddenly given uh, political equality um, or even just emancipated, right? Um, so let's see. Meanwhile, activists and preachers on both sides found a plethora of scriptures to support their respective views, right? Um, strong pro-slavery elements of the North equated abolitionism with the Industrial Revolution, um, <clears throat> believing that although slavery def definitely needed reform, many of the abolitionist fi uh, financial backers were working for their own self-interest, seeking to replace one form of abuse with another, uh, industrialized wage slavery wage labor, which they called, referred to as wage slavery, and thus gain a more compliant workforce. Slavery, along a source of unease and contention, became the focus of a legitimate national discussion in a way that would be unfathomable to most modern Americans. By the way, this is the milieu that um, George Fitzhugh comes out of, and I'll, I'll talk more about Fitzhugh in, in a few minutes, but uh, and yeah, Fitzhugh, his writings, along with some abolitionist writings of men like William Lloyd Garrison uh, and, and others um, are, that's the, uh, um, that's the basis, of course, for your final essay. Hopefully you've had a chance to, um, to uh, read through these and answer the questions related to the final essay progress uh, check. Maybe you've even started writing your essay. So anyway, um, George Fitzhugh comes out of this may loop, comes out of this context very much, right? Um, so I mentioned how, you know, Thomas Roderick Dew starts making the case in the 1830s that no, slavery um, isn't even a necessary evil. Um, it's, it's uh, he even disagrees with that. He thinks it's actually a positive good, right? It's good for the enslavers, it's good for the enslaved. Um, and uh, Fitzhugh sort of piggybacks on that. Uh, and especially this idea that I just talked about of criticism of industrial capitalism in the North, right? Uh, Fitzhugh, um, Fitzhugh really, it's, it's essentially, it's like pro-slavery Marxism, pro-slavery socialism, right? Uh, it's vehemently anti-capitalism, right? Uh, so that's the milieu that, again, Fitzhugh come, comes out of. It's important to, to kind of think about that as you're reading through his, uh, um, his writings. <clears throat> okay, continuing on. Let's see. So uh, it should be pointed out, it's really important to point out that African-Americans were um, really the strongest advocates for the immediate uh, end of slavery, the abolition of slavery. Uh, it was also clear, uh, it was always clear, excuse me, to African-Americans that when whites, when most whites uh, spoke of liberty, they essentially limited it, uh, limited this concept of liberty to themselves. Most whites didn't include blacks in these conception, uh, their conceptions of uh, all men are created equal, life, liberty, and property, liberty, autonomy, self-rule, et cetera. Um, so uh, not accepting this limitation, virtually all free black uh, community organizations, including schools, churches, fraternal uh, associations, and mutual aid societies uh, favored abolition. Um, African-American contributions to the abolitionist movement itself began in the Northeast uh, with several African-American societies, as they were known, during the late 18th century, around the time of the revolution. Uh, during the 1820s, organizations such as the Massachusetts General Colored Association uh, were formed to fight Southern slavery and Northern segregation. On uh, the African-American newspaper, Freedom's Journal, uh, published in New York in 1827, provided sustained criticisms of slavery. African-American abolitionists also preceded white abolitionists in their insistence that moral suasion alone would not um, immediately or really ever affect an end to slavery. So we needed more than moral suasion <coughs> um, than sort of brow browbeating people on moral grounds to end slavery. Um, although a lot of people kept appealing uh, to 
but putting a lot of stock and effort into moral appealing to moral sensibilities uh, and a sense of injustice and right and wrong and linking that to religion, which I'll, I'll talk about uh, right now. So for example, in 1829, David Walker, who was the son of a free bl uh, black mother and an enslaved father, published uh, a, a document called Appeal to the Colored Citizens of the World. Uh, he advocated in this document the uncompromising resistance to slavery, encouraging African Americans to fight, quote, in the glorious and heavenly cause of freedom. So that's an appeal to, to morals and, and uh, uh, sort of a higher, um, uh, it's sort of a, a higher good, so to speak, right? Uh, when Walker's pamphlet was found in the possession of African Americans in Savannah, uh, the Georgia legislature reacted quickly, enacting the death penalty for circulating publications designed to stir insurrection. Uh, seeing danger coming from troublemaking whites as well as enslaved blacks, uh, the uh, Georgia state legislature and actually other Southern uh, political bodies uh, during this time actually enacted severe penalties for teaching slaves to read and write. Other states followed suit. Um, so they saw these abolitionist activities as inherently threatening. Uh, and they tried to clamp, not surprisingly, to clamp down on them, right? Uh, knowledge is power. Uh, being able to just read um, uh, and therefore read and uh, absorb and um, and sort of transmit, uh, do something with abolitionist literature that's inherently threatening, right, to the institution of slavery. Uh, in Boston, William Lloyd Garrison represented the radical end of the white abolitionist spectrum. While he opposed slave uprisings and violent resistance, Garrison thought uh, that African Americans should, quote, share an equality with whites, end quote. He excoriated the Constitution as a pro slavery document. He advocated disillusion of the Union. Um, in order to establish a true democracy uh, without slavery. Garrison, the ascetic uh, nonconformist, uh, non um, suffice it to say, was not a popular man, even among people in the North. And uh, as an example of that, Garrison was actually, at one, at one point, uh, forced to parade through Boston with a noose uh, hanging around his neck. So uh, yeah, Garrison is advocating essentially full equality between whites and blacks. Uh, you know, and obviously abolitionism is the first step, but beyond that, full equality between whites and blacks. But he's a minority, especially in the 1830s and, and really after that to a large extent as well. Uh, that was highly controversial, uh, was, was definitely a minority uh, opinion. Uh, however, uh, he was influential in his own way. So <clears throat> among those falling under the influence of Garrison was a man named Frederick Bailey. So that's Frederick Bailey, seeing your screen there. Um, that, face probably looks familiar. Uh, he's more, uh, more commonly and eventually was known as um, Frederick, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, uh, he was eventually known as Frederick Douglass, Frederick Douglass. Um, so enslaved in Baltimore, Bailey, carrying forged papers as proof that he was a free black sailor, uh, purchased train tickets to Philadelphia and then to New York, where a free uh, African-American sailor directed him to the abolitionist David Ruggles. Ruggles then sent uh, Frederick, Frederick Douglass, um, and his new wife, Anna, um, or he's now known as Frederick Douglass, uh, to live with the family of Nathan Johnson, a free and well-to-do African-American. Uh, so to avoid slave catchers, Bailey changed his name to Douglass, right? And Frederick Douglass became a mighty spokesman for abolition. Uh, his personal experiences enabled him to counter pro-slavery propaganda um, that, uh, for, for instance, slaves were content and had an easy life. Him being a former slave, he, he uh, obviously had credibility to argue to the contrary. Right. Um, so when you think about, you know, I was going to say abolitionism, but even beyond that, just America's racial co uh, conscience, especially within the context of the 19th century. Um, and Douglas continues to be highly influential even after the Civil War and through Reconstruction, or at least attempts at Reconstruction, which we're not going to talk about really in this class. Um, yeah, really, uh, Frederick Douglass is one of the giants of the 19th century uh, and the giants of. Uh, of the issue of race uh, in American history, un undoubtedly. So Douglas and Garrison came to differ on how best to seek freedom from the enslaved. Douglas disagreed with Garrison uh, that resisting slavery through violence was wrong. So the two also disagreed actually in the Constitution, which Douglas thought could, quote, be wielded in behalf of emancipation, end quote. 
Um, like other Black Americans, Douglas coupled anti-slavery activities with demands for racial equality and justice. In uh, actually December 1847, Douglas published the first issue of his abolitionist paper, The North Star, a four-page weekly um, out of Rochester, New York. Named after the star pointing the way uh, north to fugitive slaves, the paper printed, printed, it, uh, printed it as its motto, excuse me, right is of no sex, truth is of no color, God is the father of us all, and we are all brethren, end quote. Although differences between Garrison and Douglas became bitter and irreconcilable, both men were part of a radical faction that relied on a higher law or natural law of individual conscience. So based in Boston, Garrison, Douglas, and their allies, including uh, female anti-slavery uh, activists, uh, persuade moral suasion, uh, which they believe could change hearts radically and so change the world, achieving complete and immediate uh, emancipation, wiping away, away racism, and advancing the government, uh, advancing the government of God on earth, essentially. So the Garrisonians held sway across the 1830s. However, in the 1840s, there was another group, equally religious but temperate, more moderate, more temperate, and their hopes for change uh, that came to the fore. Uh, and the, this group was broadly known as the Tappanites. Well, I'll talk about right now, the Tappanites. And uh, actually, I'll explain who that is in, in one second. Clustered around New York, around the New York businessmen, uh, excuse me, cl clustered around the New York businessmen and brothers, Lewis and Arthur Tappan. And I believe that's a picture of Lou, um, uh, sorry, Arthur Tappan um, on your screen there. This faction um, focused on political institutions. So where the Boston uh, contingent worked in hired lecture halls, church basements and shab shabby uh, newspaper offices, always in, in search of donations and petition signatures, the New York crowd took a less pie, uh, you know, sort of pie in the sky approach. The Tappanites, um, as they were called, were mostly lawyers and merchants. Um, well acquainted with the levers of power and the paying of bills, and as much concerned with channeling and limiting social change as initiating it. Firm believers in private property, they repudiated, uh, repudiated the idea that reformers uh, should rely on a higher law rather than the Constitution. Uh, to the Tappanites, civic responsibility in a free society required working within the system, um, reforming, seeking to reform the system uh, you know, according to constitutional principles and the Constitution itself, as opposed as opposed to um, igniting a an anti-slave revolution and immediate emancipation in uh, in a way that went beyond the Constitution uh, and uh, insisting upon racial equality, they certainly the Tappanites certainly uh, were not on board with that. Right, organizing the political process with all the mundane labor and pitiful compromises that entailed. Uh, that entailed, the Tappanites worked at the precinct, at the local, at, the, at state levels um, to elect anti-slavery men. By putting the right men in office, um, the Tappanites set out to transform the nation and resolve the contradictions the founding fathers had institutionalized. So fired by, uh, by conviction that the Constitution was fundamentally anti-slavery, Arthur and Lewis Tappan used the judicial process as well to defend enslaved Africans who in 1839 had mutinied and taken over the ship Amistad from Spanish slavers. Uh, the whole idea that um, the captives might have a right to bring a lawsuit troubled the Spanish minister. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Observing the proceedings, Minister uh, Argaz was incred uh, incred incredulous. Excuse me, that was the Spanish minister at the time. Uh, why he wondered uh, did did not the United States government quote interpose its authority to put down the irregularity of these proce uh, proceedings? Uh, end quote. Um, the verdict, however, went in favor of the Africans and ultimately was upheld by the U.S. Supreme Court in 1841. So they ruled in favor of the enslaved Africans. Um, Lewis Tappan and his associates gave thanks to God that the case established, quote, on uh, their words, uh, the liberties of 36 fellow men, as well as the fundamental principles of law, justice, and human rights. So that's an important judicial precedent, um, uh, this uh, Amistad uh, uh, case, an important judicial precedent within the context of, of uh, abolitionism. Okay, so let's see. Just to get a quick drink of water here. Water break. Okay, so. Sometimes you've got to drink water and put on, put on chapstick. <coughs> um, by the way, I um, I noticed that uh, 
at the end of video one, uh, my dog was like tapping on the door and scratching. And I was so focused on what I was talking about that I was uh, totally, uh, totally ignoring it. But yeah, that's, that's my dog, Annie. She's an eight year old uh, standard poodle. So if you're wondering what was, what was happening there, um, just remembered. Uh, so anyway, uh, yeah. So the two factions of the abolitionist movement, the Taponites on one side and the Gersonians, right? The immediate abolitionists, you know, revolutionaries and reformers, the Taponites, uh, you know, fundamentally really hated each other, right? Uh, and that was an important aspect of this, of this movement, um, uh, an important thing to understand. So yeah, the, these two factions, one fundamentally sentimental uh, and radical and really revolutionary and working at moral suasion and the other fundamentally political and working, uh, more comfortable working within a, the political process as opposed to tearing it down, right? Um, uh, we're not complementary, uh, suffice it to say, we're not complementary of one another. They made war as bitterly with each other um, as with the forces of slavery itself. A powerful subtext of race and gen uh, gender conflict, it's important to understand, undergirded the split between the two groups. At stake, the Taponates insisted over and over was the su sustained existence of a republic with white men in charge. The Taponates wanted a white man's republic, and they thought slavery was getting in the way of that, right? So reform, uh, you know, but moderate, sensible, um, reform had to take place to ensure the stability of a white man's uh, republic, a white man's America, a republic with white men in charge, essentially. Um, however, uh, anyone attending a Garrisonian rally can understand uh, what they meant, uh, what, uh, what was threatening to them, right? Uh, black or for example, black orders such as Douglas, uh, Henry Bibb, and Garrison Box Brown spoke uh, before the gatherings. Uh, often telling tales of victimization and loss, breaking hearts and firing passions. Um, oftentimes white preachers and would-be preachers like Henry Beecher and Theodore Weld uh, agitated their audience with scandalous stories of whippings and rape. Um, so there's a strong emotional appeal here that ties into the Second Great Awakening. Um, which uh, I think McClay, you, know, uh, you read about in, in McClay. Um, <clears throat> also, white women, uh, it's perhaps the most threatening part of this uh, from a Taponite's perspective, uh, white women themselves seized the podium and spoke out uh, in sort of harsh, um, uh, harsh, you know, stringent uh, uh, tones against bondage, right? Indeed, many uh, to many, it seemed that the South Carolinian uh, turned abolitionist Sarah Grimke uh, and the stern Quaker Lucretia Mott became like, well, men uh, rather than, than women, right? Uh, worst of all to these critics uh, was the sight of a black woman such as Sojourner Truth. You might find her at one of these Garrisonian rallies, right? Uh, speaking out, shouting, and calling all categories of social order into dispute. To many white men, such performances seemed, uh, you know, threatening, desperately threatening. Uh, though they jeered Amelia Bloomer's ludicrous attempts at dress reform and smirked at how Lydia Child and uh, Angelina Grimke uh, henpecked their, their husbands, so to speak, uh, the changes and gender relations they saw unfolding before them seemed genuinely sobering, you know, threatening. Uh, all this was was threatening uh, and and repulsive from a Taponite's perspective. And remember, they're both on the same team technically in terms of abolitionism. Um, so the abolitionists in America were part of a broader world reform movement that crossed continents. Um, uh, this uh, Garrisonian. Uh, movement. Garrison's um, uh, liberator uh, was filled with news of reform movements in other parts of the world. So yeah, you have this uh, Garrisonian mode of abolitionism, which is really international, which is quite uh, radical, quite revolutionary. Uh, and really, it's going beyond abolitionism and advocating for like full equality. And the Taponites fundamentally disagree with that, right? Um, <clears throat> so However, the abolitionist attack on the peculiar institution charged the majority white Southern viewpoint, um, sorry, sorry, changed the majority white Southern viewpoint that's, excuse me, that slavery was sinful. Brilliant thinkers denied Jefferson's assertion of the contrary and declared uh, that slavery was actually, quote, a positive good. For example, Senator John C. Calhoun, who built his fortune on slavery, announced in 1838 that Southerners, uh, goaded by anti-slavery agitation, now had a new attitude towards slavery. Uh, this is a quote from Calhoun. He says, quote, this agitation has produced one happy effect at least. It has compelled us uh, to the South to look into the nature and character of this great institution and to correct many false impressions that even we had entertained in relation to it, end quote. But other so Southerners um, used to think that slavery, quote, was a moral and political evil, uh, end quote. He declared that they come to a different realization. Um, he said, quote, 
we see it now in its true light and regard it as the most safe and stable basis for free institutions in the world, referring to slavery. Right. In South Carolina first and then elsewhere in the South, uh, throughout the South, the obvious note of apology was subtracted from discussions of slavery. Slavery was now unequivocally good, <clears throat> uh, they argued, <clears throat> because it brought Africans into civilization and into Christianity. They argued that slavery was beneficial for America because it only uh, because only in the South had conservative values and the measured accumulation of wealth allowed men of leisure to develop a higher sense of duty toward their inferiors and then understanding of their crucial role in the advance of Western civilization. Um, and if this sounds like the argument uh, of uh, uh, George Fitzhugh, you're you're quite correct on that. Uh, so again, this leads us to uh, the context that George Fitzhugh sort of sprang out of. For pro-slavery theorists like George Fitzhugh, uh, slavery was uh, uh, made possible, excuse me, a white man's democracy. Okay, so I, I wanna end with a couple of points here. So I think first of all, um, I think we could see uh, from my discussion of antebellum slavery and antebellum anti-slavery, I think we can pretty clearly see that it wasn't as simple as slavery being a dominant force, which of course it was, uh, that was eventually overtaken by a new and dominant and or a new force that uh, you know was novel and ascendant and eventually became dominant and of course I'm referring to anti-slavery right um, so it's not as simple as uh, slavery um, anti-slavery just kind of uh, stole slavery's thunder and that was the end of slavery in the United States right um, it's much more complicated than that, right? Uh, the two the two sides are playing off of each other. And even saying that there's two sides is an oversimplification, right? Uh, <clears throat> so in a sense, slavery, uh, referring to the institution of slavery, uh, men like George Fitzhugh, who are unabashed pro-slavery apologists, um, other plantation owners, Southern politicians. So uh, slavery as an institution, and the defenders of slavery, in a sense, are, you know, are responding to uh, the rise of anti-slavery in the 1830s, right? Uh, and also Nat, Tur Nat Turner's insurrection, Nat Turner's rebellion, and respond to this by re essentially doubling down on slavery, uh, redoubling their commitments to an investment in uh, and, and defense of um, slavery, right? Uh, so another way to think about it, you know, slavery existed in a colonial context. Uh, it wasn't that different from indentured servitude initially, uh, but eventually racialized, we talked about previously racialized slavery um, makes its way through all, all the British colonies, but especially in, in the South, right? Which for economic and topographical and climate reasons and other reasons develops into a slave-based economy, right? Uh, this in turn provokes a response uh, after the American Revolution uh, and rising anti-slavery sentiment, which comes from England to a certain extent, uh, and really, um, has a coming out party in about 1831 at the publication of the Liberator, the, the Garrisonian newspaper, and Nat Turner's Rebellion as well. And abolitionism seems like a force to be reckoned with. Uh, it's an ascendant uh, force in American life and American politics. And the slave power responds, right, uh, by doubling down on slavery. Um, and of course, a lot of this has to do with what's happening with cotton, the cotton revolution in, in the deep South. Um, so again, it's not as simple as slavery, anti-slavery sort of stole slavery thunder, right? And they I want to talk a little bit more about that in, uh, in a second, actually right now. So this brings me to the sort of critical thinking opinion question I wanted to ask you guys. So <clears throat> um, for most of these lecture video questions, typically I have four or five or six questions for you. I'll, I'll probably have, uh, about the same amount of questions, maybe maybe a couple more than than that. But um, so I've gotten the habit of my last question, you know, is is a lot of times kind of a critical thinking analysis kind of opinion question, and that's what I wanted to do in this case as well. So I wanted you, you to think about anti-slavery, to think about the rise of abolitionism. Um, and uh, I'm going to make this one of the lecture video questions, but in this case, I'm going to talk about it. Um, <clears throat> Uh, right now. So the question is, what explains rising anti-slavery sentiment in the United States in the early to mid 19th century? So again, the question is, what explains rising uh, anti-slavery sentiment um, in the United States in the early to mid 19th century? So uh, a few things about this question, first of all. So I think this, so wait, wait, let me talk about what I'm not asking. So I'm not asking exactly, although this question fundamentally is related to this, right? Uh, is, is a piece of this. 
is in, in, inextricably tied to this, but I'm not asking how slavery was abolished, right? Uh, so the, kind of the premise here is that in order for slavery to even have a, you know, a poss any, even a small possibility of being abolished in the United States, there had to be an upsurge. Uh, there had to be a significant uptick in, uh, in anti-slavery feeling, right, among the American public. Um, now, how was slavery ab actually abolished, right? That's a more complicated question. And ultimately, the Civil War uh, decided that question, the election of Abraham Lincoln, the secession of the South, and the Civil War, uh, which we'll, uh, we'll talk about next week. But so this is a different question. Like, what explains rising anti-slavery feelings, specifically in the United States? Uh, but it goes beyond that to a certain extent. So I'm going to talk about that, uh, about that right now. And uh, I think to answer this question, obviously, you want to watch the video, which we're watching right now, uh, where I talk about you know, slavery and anti-slavery. Uh, also, McClay, uh, pages 127 to 129, I think is pretty helpful uh, when it comes to the origins of like what explains abolitionism. And actually, I'm going to uh, uh, refer to that and read an excerpt of that in, in a second here. Uh, <clears throat> I think also remember that slavery, as I talked about, I think in the very first video, slavery was mostly accepted through most of human history. And furthermore, it was basically accepted and certainly was widely practiced even in the in places like the middle colonies in New England and in the North more broadly in a British colonial and early American context, right? Early United States context. So just kind of, I, I think people have an assumption that, oh, slavery kind of had it coming. Um, people, you know, the modern world comes and people just kind of get a little more sophisticated and they just kind of decided like, now we've had enough of slavery. Uh, I'm not convinced by that argument. Um, so, I, I think we, especially for an institution that is as old essentially as human history and has existed on every continent for thousands of years, I think it's incumbent upon us in a modern day context, right, to get beyond our kind of inherent disgust and revulsion uh, we feel towards slavery and enslavement and the institution of slavery and kind of think about um, think about this from their vantage point. What explains this rise in anti-slavery feeling? So and let me say as well, historians don't have <clears throat> a definitive answer to this question. Um, different, very accomplished, very smart uh, historians who've spent their entire lives studying this um, vehemently disagree with each other. So certainly there's no one right answer. Um, so I just want you to kind of think about some different options here. Um, and, and by the way, so I, I'm going to give, so basically I'm going to give you a few different, uh, theories that have been posited by prominent historians and people, you know, experts on, on the subject and kind of weigh the pros and cons of these explanations a little bit. Uh, it's not that you have to posit one of these in your answer. Um, your answer could be multiple. You could say it's, uh, you know, partially explanation one, explanation two, explanation three. You could say that all these explanations are bad, but I, you know, but explain why you think they're bad. Um, and, uh, and then try and posit your own explanation. Um, so yeah, there's no necessarily definitive right answer here, but here's some ideas. Um, so I think quite obvious, the, the most obvious idea I think is the enlightenment, uh, enlightenment ideas and enlightenment rhetoric, i.e. Uh, rhetoric, excuse me, i.e. all men are created equal, right? Uh, they're endowed by their creator with inalienable rights, uh, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And of course, um, uh, Thomas Jefferson got those ideas from John Locke, right? These ideas, this idea of individual worth, natural rights. Um, so we're not, uh, you know, all men are created equal. We're not born equal in terms of talent and ambition and circumstances. But in a certain sense, we should be treated equal under the law or equal um, in a certain respect, right? <laughs> so, you know, quite obviously that's at odds with slavery. Um, but again, you know, those... Uh, uh, the Enlightenment didn't begin uh, when slavery really took off in 1831, right? Uh, so what explains this amount of time where these ideas are becoming, uh, you know, a lot of people are engaging with this idea, these ideas, but slavery isn't just existing, but is expanding in some cases. Now we get to the, you know, the early 18th century and it begins to be abolished, right? Um, but I think perhaps we need more than more of an explanation than just enlightenment ideas of rhetoric of individual worth. Um, so here's some other uh, some other ideas. So um, some historians would attribute the rise of uh, abolitionist you know sentiment among the general public and a committed group of abolitionists that actually made it happen, <clears throat> actually made uh, uh, slay you know affected the end of slavery essentially. Uh, a lot of historians would attribute it to the Second Great Awakening. Uh, and 
you know, if you think about it, leading abolitionists, many of, actually most of leading abolitionists, especially in an American context, are evangelical Protestants, um, chief among them, William Lloyd Garrison, right? Um, so really there, you know, the impetus for the abolitionist project is really uh, the Second Great Awakening itself, right? And uh, it, by the way, this kind of goes back to a point McClay made, and I think there was a question about this in one of the, le the um, uh, textbook um, uh, question, short answer questions about the connection between the Enlightenment, <coughs> uh, the Enlightenment on the one hand and the Second Great Awakening on the other hand. Uh, and you know, quite obviously the connection is uh, they both value the worth of the individual. It's re really two things that are related, right? So they really emphasize the, um, the you know, individual worth. You, the individual person, need to figure things out for yourself, whether it comes to your personal relationship with God or your interpretation of the Bible, in the, in the case of the Great Awakening, or whether it comes to, you know, sort of the scientific and technological revolution and the laws of the universe. Let's not just uh, accept that, the you know, this is received wisdom and therefore this is correct. No, we need to apply logic and, and scientific method to arrive at the truth. That's the enlightenment or a big part of the enlightenment in, in a nutshell. And, and so in that sense, this idea of individual empowerment, I think is a connection between the enlightenment and the second great awakening. Um, <clears throat> and part and parcel with individual empowerment is a, dis a fundamental distrust of established institutions, right? Whether it's just institutions of knowledge, um, accepted practices and beliefs about the world, right? Whether within the context of science or religion or a little bit of both, or established institutions like church hierarchies, right? So, um, so you could see how the Second Great Awakening um, would sort of, nat and, and the Enlightenment as well, would sort of naturally, uh, perhaps, nat you know, uh, uh, if you're very steeped in this rhetoric and these ideas, that would quite naturally lead you, uh, at least at least some people, uh, to anti-slavery um, feelings, to, to abolitionism, right? Um, to an attack on an established institution. Uh, which had been accepted throughout most of human history, but now really needed to be examined. And examining this in the light of, of just basic logic and enlightenment rhetoric, right? Um, and and the, the coming of the modern world, um, slavery would seem to be at odds with, with a lot of these things. So that's, that's another idea. Um, another idea, and I've actually done some research into this, uh, I'll try not to go on and on about this idea, but uh, another idea is that abolitionism uh, can be explained at least in part by the rise of capitalism. So capitalism rose uh, at about roughly uh, the, the same time that slavery fell, right? So we talked uh, last module about, I, in my lecture videos, I talked about the market revolution, the communications revolution, the financial revolution, technological revolution, um, economic development, <clears throat> uh, and really the rise of American capitalism and eventually industrial capitalism, at least the beginnings of industrial capitalism in an antebellum, uh, the antebellum context that we're early, early republic and antebellum context that we're studying. And that's really happening at the same time. Well, it's tricky, right? So slavery is, as I mentioned, is connected to that, right? And slavery continues to rise uh, very much in lockstep with, especially in the United States, uh, with all the things that I just mentioned, and then slavery falls spectacularly, right? In, uh, uh, with the election of Lincoln and, and civil war. So, you know, but broadly speaking, capitalism rises and slavery falls. What's the connection between these two things? So a lot of uh, historians have, and theorists have posited different ideas about this. I'm just going to present two different ideas about how capitalism and slavery, anti-slavery might be connected here. So one idea is that capitalism's rise roughly coincides with, uh, or uh, an explanation for capitalism's rise roughly coinciding with slavery's fall. Um, so one idea is that perhaps the commodification of wage labor increased sensitivity to how slavery commodified a person's body, family, and personality. Um, this uh, theory, get back, getting back into historiography a little bit here, but this theory is mostly associated with historian John Ashworth, who basically argued that capitalism's emergence in England and then uh, eventually in America produced a sizable expansion in the number of wage laborers. A social and economic class um, afforded relatively low status according to classical Republican ideology. Um, a worldview that saw late wage laborers as inherently dependent on their employers and hence not much better off than slaves. So wage labor was really uh, equated with slavery according to classical Republican ideology. Uh, that's why Jefferson wanted a nation of yeoman farmers, right? Independent, 
um, autonomous, uh, autonomous economically, and therefore presumably uh, autonomous socially and politically and culturally, right? Um, so the shift towards a person's labor uh, becoming just another commodity for sale in the marketplace uh, produced, according to Ashworth, a need for, quote, a rigid separation, a rigid separation between the things that could rightly become commodities and those that could not become commodities, right? So the fact that a person's labor was now frequently commodified made it paramount that a person's body, a person's family, and a person's personality were judged to be outside of the legitimate influence of the market, placing enslavement for the first time beyond the realm of acceptability. So essentially, Ash Ashworth is saying, uh, is arguing that capitalism and specifically the rise of wage labor um, and many more people being involved in, in wage labor for their, their livelihoods, essentially, uh, made people anxious, made people nervous, uh, facilitated a re-examination of what's commodifiable. So this idea that your labor is commodifiable, um, he argues, is a relatively new idea that comes out of the rise of capitalism, right? And so if, uh, you know, if your labor is now commodifiable, well, that's threatening to a lot of people. What else is commodifiable, right? Uh, now your labor, you know, really is relying upon your body to a certain extent, but how, do, how far do we extend that, right? Um, uh, yeah, a person's body, a person's family, a person's personality, right? Uh, and this gets into issues of, you know, uh, sex work, prostitution, right? Should your body, literally your body be for sale in the open market in that case, right? Uh, and that really, uh, these debates led to a debate over slavery, which more than anything uh, you could possibly imagine is ownership of the things I just mentioned. Uh, and within the context of enslavement, your body, your family, um, your personality is owned by another individual, right? So that's one uh, explanation. Another explanation is that the plantation system of the U.S. South and, and the Caribbean as well would fit into this um, uh, from this era that was uh, tied to global capitalism. So the plantation system is a capitalist innovation, right, within an agricultural antebellum context, right, that this brought about a situation where it wasn't just slavery, it was an unacceptably cruel and inhumane and torturous uh, form of slavery, right? Um, that, you know, this along with the, uh, you know, really abolitionists, uh, and this is like changes in media and other factors, um, getting the word out um, uh, with these like slave narratives, right? From, like, for example, Equiano, um, who, who we talked about. Uh, and this really, triggered an unprecedented anti-slavery response. So yes, slavery had always been there, but not this kind of slavery. This capitalist plantation slavery was fundamentally different. And this crossed the threshold by which people, uh, enough people decided they had, they'd had, uh, they'd had, they had had an enough. That's what I'm trying to say. Uh, and interestingly, uh, interestingly, McClay puts a lot of, uh, seems to put a lot of stock in a related uh, thing, which is the publication of Uncle Tom's Cabin, right? Let me, uh, let me actually read this really quickly. Yeah, if you want to take a look at McClay, I think this is page 128. So I'll give you a second or you can pause the video. Uh, McClay, one, uh, page 128, the second to last paragraph on page 128, starting with, but one more thing. So McClay says, but one more thing remains to be pointed out. One of the chief forces that shifted Northern antebellum Amer American public opinion about slavery was not a treatise or a sermon or a speech or a work of political theory. It was a work of fiction. Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin or Life Among the Lowly, published in 1852, which became the best-selling American novel of the 19th century. Stowe herself was an evangelical and a member of one of the leading evangelical families in the nation. And she used the novel to depict the life of its title character, a slave who was sold by his owner and torn from his family but he retained his loving spirit and Christian decency through a uh, horrendous sequence of cruel and violent acts eventuating in his death. It left an indelible mark on all, uh, on all who read it. The book succeeded in people's minds, um, not because of its cogent uh, preaching on questions of abstract individual rights or abolitionism, but because it appealed vividly and emotionally to antebellum American sense that no institution could defend it, sorry, could be defended if it so brutally and pitilessly violated the sanctity of the family. Uh, it succeeded because it endowed its Black characters with undeniable dignity and brought the reader to identify uh, with their suffering and to feel the injustice of bondage as a denial of personal freedom, one of the central features of the exper uh, American experiment. And it succeeded all the more because it showed that one of the worst aspects of slavery was, a, was its degrading effect uh, upon the master class itself, 
In other words, it demonstrated the comprehensive wrongness of the institution by showing in a powerful and plausible way its awful consequences to everyone involved in it. This observation about slavery's reciprocal effects was one um, that many others, including Thomas Jefferson himself, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> had already made about slavery in the past and a point that Lincoln was fond of making also. Um, but it was the vividness of Mrs. Stowe's novel uh, that gave the point enough moral weight to change people's minds. So that's something to think about as well, right? Um, sometimes uh, something happens that just sort of catches, uh, that catches fire in the moment, fits in with the, the milieu, the zeitgeist, right, so to speak. Uh, and if you think about what Nicolay is describing, um, I mean, you can sort of interpret it for yourself, but I think that encapsulates a lot of things that, that I've talked about in the last few minutes, right? A lot of explanations for the rise of anti-slavery sentiment. Um, so you have enlightenment rhetoric and ideas, all men are created equal, life, liberty, and property, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You have the se second great awakening, empowering the individual within a religious context, right? Um, and uh, an emphasis on sort of feeling and emotion, right? And so much anti-slavery agitation, especially from a Dirisonian uh, or even Frederick Douglass perspective was emotional ra rather than logical in the vein of the Tappanites, right? Uh, uh, maybe the, the stuff I talked about with regards to the rise of capitalism would sort of fit in here and uh, the plantation system, you know, certainly. Right. Um, so I think you combine this explanation of the plantation system, um, which was tied to global capitalism being, uh, OK, it was enslavement. Slavery wasn't new, but that form of slavery and that level of brutality uh, was, uh, in a sense, new. Uh, and but of course, people had to know about it. And one of the ways they, they found out about it um, was via Uncle Tom's Cabin. Right. Um, people that wouldn't necessarily read Enlightenment uh, books on the subject, right, uh, weren't steeped in abolitionist literature, maybe um, got their hands on Uncle Tom's Cabin and their minds were changed in, in that case, right? So that kind of points towards a multi, you know, mo uh, multiple things influencing the rise of abolitionism in this era. So really it's up to you. What do you think, right? <clears throat> so I'm going to have you uh, put together your 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 best response uh, for you know the best explanation you can come up with for the rise of abolitionism. Okay, so that's it uh, for the module five lecture videos. Thanks so much for listening and taking notes and everything, and uh, have a good one. Thanks, guys.